Hey, welcome back, everybody. Today, I want to talk about floor and decor, ticker symbol FND. This is a subscriber requested video. In fact, I've had a few subscribers reach out to me and ask me to do a stock analysis on this company. I think the major reason why is Berkshire Hathaway has been buying shares from this company pretty regularly over the last couple of quarters. They even added about 400% to their position this past quarter. Now, keep in mind, Berkshire Hathaway obviously has a huge, massive portfolio, a couple hundred billion dollars worth, and this particular stock is about 0.1% of the entire portfolio. And it could also make a case that it's probably not Warren Buffett that's buying this company. It's probably one of his protégés. But nonetheless, Berkshire Hathaway has been buying share. So we're going to dig into this company and talk about what they do. We're going to look at the last few years and see what they've done historically for financials. Then we're going to value this company from an intrinsic value calcula calculation based on operating income of the business. So let's just do that right now. So let's first look at the stock price for this company over the last five years. Now, keep in mind, they became public. In, I want to say it was April 2017. Somewhere around April 2017 is when they became public. This company's been around since 2000, but they've only been public for about five years. And you can see if you would have bought them five years ago, you'd be up about 70% during that time frame, which is about 11% compounded annual growth rate. So it looks like when they IPO'd or kind of when they first started out, it was roughly around $40 from what I could tell on this chart. And right now it's trading around roughly around $75 today. All right. So let's talk about what this business does. And this is straight out of their 10K. So this company was founded in 2000. Florida Decor is a high growth, differentiated, multi-channel specialty retailer of hard surface flooring and related accessories with 160 warehouse format stores across 33 different states as of December 30th, 2021. They believe they offer the industry's broadest assortment of tile, wood laminate, vinyl, and natural stone flooring, along with decorative and installation accessories in adjacent categories at everyday low prices, positioning us as the one-stop destination for their customers. So this is a big warehouse type setup where it's around 78 thousand square feet so big massive warehouse they carry everything floor and decor related obviously according to their name with, with tile flooring that sort of thing and we'll kind of get into what kind of gives them their advantage compared to other stores say like a home depot or lowe's or other companies that are in this type of business as we go through this this video so uh, i thought this was a really good slide out of their investor presentation it talks about their sales breakdown from 2016 to 2021. And you can see back in 2016, 31% of their sales came from tile. And now 23% comes from tile. And the largest sales currently as of this last year was their laminate and luxury vinyl. So I think this is a good snapshot, kind of see how, how well this company is positioned in their market because they can change, they can adapt with the size warehouse that they have. They can, they can easily change up the, their setup within the warehouse dependent on what is selling for that year. In fact, if you go from state to state, and they actually talk about this in their investor presentation, there's a variety from state to state what sells the best in that state. So they can be flexible. They can you know transition. They can pivot their different merchandise they have in the store dependent on what that location wants and what the what's really in demand for that year too. So I think that is great. Uh, for the company, we talked about their warehouses around 78,000 square feet, and they have that's all tile, wood, stone type type flooring. Where like a home improvement store, say like a Lowe's for example, or Home Depot, is around three to five thousand square feet for the t same type of product. Or a specialty tile flooring company would be around twenty thousand square feet. Specialty flooring would be five thousand to twenty thousand. So you can see that floor and decor has a much larger scale of of assortment of product for their consumers overall. Something that gives them a unique differentiation from their competition is that they eliminate the middlemen. So this is how most companies in their industry function. So you have their supply chain goes from a manufacturer, then it goes through an agent or broker, then it goes through an importer, then a distributor, and then finally to the retail business, say like a Home Depot, Lowe's, or whatever, 
Well, floor and decor doesn't operate that way. They eliminate all those type of middlemen, so they deal directly with the manufacturer. So the manufacturer delivers right to floor and decor, over 240 different suppliers and 24 different countries. So because of that, they can actually offer lower prices to their consumers and they can actually have higher margins. Now, we'll, we'll talk about this as we go through this video, but if you look at their financials, their margins don't look great right now because they're growing so much. So you kind of have to really look into the future to really see where this company is going to be because you look at the numbers now, it really doesn't give a great picture on where this company is going to be and the type of margins and the type of operating income, even free cash that this company is going to generate in the future because of their business model. This company really understands their customers extremely, extremely well. So they, they kind of divide their customers up into like three different categories. So they have their, you know, just normal customers that just kind of walk in. They're looking through, kind of looky-loos, just the, the normal DIY type person that's at home, like myself, where you have your pro customers, which are just your general DIY guys, or even, you know, maybe someone that has a smaller company, for example, that might be functioning, might be a pro customer. They get discounts through the rewards program that they sign up to. And then their third type of customer is commercial. So that's kind of how they distinguish their different customers that they have. Now they're just general customer that walks in every day. Their household income is around 96,000. Their year, the home they built was prior to the 1980s, 51% of the time. They've been in their residence for about seven years. Their home value is around $300,000. Now this next slide will talk about their pro customers. And this is what they're really focusing. They're trying to get more people to become part of a pro uh, premier rewards program because they tend to spend three times more. In fact, top 10% of pros purchased 37 projects with them and increased average spend of 24% in 2021. So they found that they spend three times more so they can get more and more people to move over to this kind of loyalty based program is kind of how I look at it. It will help the company long term. And I do think that is going to happen over time. Now here's some competition slide that kind of gives a good idea what floor and decor does and kind of gives them their competitive advantage. So you can see these circles over here, for example, like low prices, that's kind of what people go to the home improvement center, say like a Lowe's or a Home Depot, for example, they tend to get low prices there, but the home improvement stores, you really don't get the full aspect of everything else. So that you don't get the, the different differentiation of good, better and best type products as far as being you know in stock they do okay designer services are just basically non non-functional not even there at all where floor and decor they they offer everything they offer you know designer services great service low prices in stock good better best type of differentiation of products that they offer localized assortment as well go on here strong track record of growing comparable store sales and this is really really impressive so when i look at retail store comps you look at walmart for example it's probably in like the one or two percent range uh sprouts farmers markets which i've talked on this channel before it's around like two percent if you look at this before pre uh, pandemic. The stores were anywhere from 11% all the way up to 22%. They did see a bit of a dip in 2019 and 2020, but in 2021, they saw it jump right up to 27%. So if it's doing over 10%, that is very, very good. So it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next several years, but over a 10-year comp, it was 14.5% overall. Fantastic. So their total addressable market is huge in this space. If you think about it, home improvement stores from Home Depot, Lowe's, I mean, they're going to make more money every single year. People are going to be updating their house, whether it's every five years, every 10 years, who knows, but that is certainly a huge market out there. In fact, they're saying their total addressable market is between 49 and 54 billion dollars, which is just absolutely huge. Here's some really aggressive future growth that they think that they can hit. So right now they're around 160 stores in 33 different states and over a four year store growth. It's been 93% from 2017 to 2021. They think they should be around 192 stores this year, 230, then 275. So very, very impressive. So their store growth over the last five years has been around 18% compounded annual growth rate. Like we talked about before, they have 160 stores in 33 
different states. Something I find really, really important is how this company is going to increase their operating income over time. When I look at companies, you know, the, the companies that come to mind that are just really, really well run, you, you're talking about Coca-Cola, you're talking about Home Depot, uh, these companies have been around for a long time. It's really hard for them to grow their operating income. They kind of, they've already saturated the market. They can only do so much. I'm sure they can cut costs here and there in some areas, but their operating income is pretty much their operating income. Companies like a Florida Core that is growing tremendously has a huge opportunity to improve their operating margins over time. And so I like this slide because it'll come into fruition when we look at valuation for this company. And we look at from 2021 to 2024, they're expecting their operating income growth to grow between 90 and 100%, which is a compounded annual growth rate of 24 to 26%. Keep in mind that they think they're going to be around 11 to 11.5% 11 of operating income in 2024. I think they're going to actually be higher that years into the future. If you look at Home Depot specifically, they're around 14 to 15% operating income. With the business model that Florida Core has, they can actually be better than Home Depot from an operating income perspective. I think there's no doubt that they can be in the, the 14, 15, 16% operating income range years into the future. It's going to take them a while as their growth slows down, but I think they can hit those numbers which I think is extremely conservative. Now, if we look at competitive advantage for this company, this is kind of how I think they differentiate themselves from their competition. So they directly source private label flooring from 240 suppliers in over 20 countries as compared to peers who purchase branded products through their distributors. The company stores have 76,000 square feet, it's closer to 78,000, of retail space dedicated to hard flooring, while Piers, Home Depot, and Lowe's dedicate only 5,000 square feet to their flooring category. By cutting out branded players and the one or two layers of distributor or middlemen, they generate a price advantage relative to peers of up to 30 to 40% at retail while generating gross margins similar to Home Depot. All right, so next up, let's go talk about the big five numbers. If you don't know what the big five numbers are, this is sales per share, earnings per share, free cash flow per share, and then book value per share. And then finally, return on invested capital. Now, a lot of people may be asking, why do I look on a per share basis? This kind of looks at how Phil Town looks at companies. And the reason why is it factors in the issuance of additional shares and also factors in any buybacks. And you have to be really careful as an investor because you might be looking at a company that's growing on the top line 30 40%, but if they're issuing 30 to 40% more shares every single year, it's completely mitigating the growth that they have. So it's really important to look on a per share basis overall. So let's go take a look at these numbers now. All right. So keep in mind, like we've talked about previously, this company became public in 2017. So we don't have numbers from 2012 to 2016. We can only run off the last five years, but uh, we'll go, we'll look at what we have. All right. So from 2017 to 2020, the company grew sales per share from $14 to $32. That is a 22% compounded annual growth rate for this company. That's, that's really good. Earnings per share from a dollar to $2 and 68 cents. That's 26% growth per year. Now free cash flow has dropped. It's gone from seven cents to negative $1 per share. We'll come back to free cash flow in a second because uh, I want to dig into this a little bit more and explain what's going on with the company. Book value per share has grown from $4 to $12. That's 28% compounding on the growth rate. Return on invested capital has been anywhere from not, or excuse me, 8% you know, to 16% in the last five years. On average, it's been 12%. That, to me, is extremely impressive and I think is a huge indication that this company's long-term return on vested capital is going to be 20 30% or more. Keep in mind that Home Depot has been around 40% historically. So I, I really think because of their margins that they're able to, to, to generate and will be able to increase over time, this number is really going to go up. So you're talking, this is a company that has not a ton of earnings, not a ton of free cash flow, but they're still able to generate a return on vested capital average of 12%. To me, that, that's huge, and that's only going to grow over time. Now let's take a look again at this free cash flow number of negative 
Because when I looked at this, like, oh, that doesn't look good. They were barely positive for three years, and this huge uptick in 2020, and then this drop in 2021. So if we go take a look at a, a cash flow statement, free cash flow is cash from operations minus CapEx or capital expenditures. Look at 2021, this number right here. Uh, excuse me, I guess it's the one above it. Cash from operations is, is $300 million, and their capital expenditures was $400 million. And what's happening when I dug into their earnings call as of the end of the, the fourth quarter, 2021, the company is putting a lot of money into capital expenditures in the form of new stores. So if you think about it, 2020 was a very oddity year. They kind of slowed down going forward with new stores because everything was going on with the, with the environment. They started, they got back to that growth in 2021. And I expect their free cash flow to be negative probably over the next three years because of all the CapEx they're going to be spending, spending with these new stores that they're going into place. Keep in mind, you know, they're growing well over 20% per year for the new stores they're putting into place. And they think they, they can actually reach 500 stores in, you know, several years out into the future, and they have 160 today. So until their growth starts slowing down, before some of their margins start expanding because of that, I think they're putting a lot of money back into the business, and I just don't expect free cash to pause over the next couple of years. Next, if we focus on their debt, and specifically looking at net debt over EBIT, their average has been about 3.4 over the last five years. I like to see it under three. That's a better indication to me that the company's not carrying a ton of debt compared to their operating income. I'm not too worried about this. They actually don't have a ton of debt on their books. In fact, if we go take a look real quick at their some balance sheet numbers, their cash right now, they don't have a ton of cash on hand. You're talking about $31 million. Overall, their total debts are around $1.4 billion. Long-term debts around $195 billion. So they don't carry a ton of debt on their, their books. And keep in mind that operating margins are going to increase over time. Now, if we take a look at the number of shares that have been increasing over time, it has been increasing from around 95 million shares up to 105 million shares. So they definitely are increasing their shares, not by a huge amount. If we still look at those big five numbers factoring in the issuance of shares, I mean, you're still talking 22% sales, top line growth, 26% earnings per share growth. So to me, the free cash flow number, again, does not do a justification on how well this company is growing. And I don't think overall they have a lot of debt. So their balance sheet looks pretty good. Their growth looks pretty good. Now, as far as a multiple goes for this company, they are trading trading at a very, very high multiple. Uh, on average, they've been trading on a 38 EV over EBIT. So pretty high. Now, their operating margins have been around 9, 8, 8, 9, and 10%. And like I said previously in this video, I think they're going to be around 15, 16% long term. The company thinks they're going to be around 11 to 12% by 2024. So now let's shift over and let's take a look at valuation for this company in order to do that i'm going to take a look at operating income and then grow it out over the next 10 years to determine what the intrinsic value of this company is based on returns that i want to get all right so let's jump over to this next tab here and what i'm doing here is i'm first looking at sales for the company and I'm looking at growth numbers for this company over the next 10 years for sales, and then figuring out what I think the operating margins are going to be for this business, figuring out what operating margins per share is gonna be, and then figure out what the an enterprise value will be for the future, and then discount it back to today based on what uh, an IRR re required return that I want for this company. So I think the company is going to grow top line, grow 26%, 20, 18, 14, 16, 15, and then tailor it down all the way down to 7% out 10 years into the future. So essentially, I believe this company from 2017 of $1.3 billion on top line is going to be around $13 billion 10 years out into the future. Now, operating margins, you know, I think they'll be around 10%. You know, this year, 10%, next year, 11%, then around 11.5%, then 12, 12, uh, 13, 13, 13, and then 14%. And based on that, I think a future intrinsic uh, enterprise value for this company should be around $30 billion. Today, it is trading at a $9.6 billion here. 
Now, I think a good multiple for this company 10 years out in the future should be around a 16. You could make a debate it could be higher than that because of their you know 15 percent you know compounded annual growth rate that I expect them to be over the next 10 years. But we're going to be conservative here. We're going to say 16. Uh, they are trading around a 29 right now, but I'm going to say 16. And a 10% required rate of return for this company, I think the intrinsic value for Florida Decor is $106 as it stands right now. That is a 27% margin of safety. So that looks pretty interesting. So again, I think compounding annual growth rate for sales would be 15% per year. I think operating income is going to grow 18% as low margins improve over time. I think long-term, uh, long term, this company should be around 14, 15, 16% operating margins. I think their return on vested capital could be 30 to 40%. So, uh, very interesting. Very, very interesting. That's why it's always good to look into what the company is doing and how the company is growing and what their operating margins are going to be in the future. So, based on these assumptions right here that you see in front of you, I think the return on investment for this company is going to be this. So for example, if the company was trading at $68, I would expect around a 15% return on investment for this company over the next 10 years. So that's on a per year basis. And it's pretty close to 68. I think it's trading around 75-ish, something like that today, somewhere around there. It might be even lower than that. So if you look you know, six months from now on the stock is trading at $44. I would expect around a 20% return on investment for this company per year over the next 10 years. So uh, there's a decent margin of safety. I think they certainly have a competitive advantage. I think their margins are going to grow over time. So this is this is an interesting stock. This is a really interesting stock. I, uh, when I looked at the management, I didn't see any red flags there. So very, very interesting. I mean, I would love to hear from you guys. I mean, what do you think about Floor and Decor? Have you looked in this company? What do you think about this valuation? You know, with me coming up with $106 for, you know, the intrinsic share price for this company. I'll also mention too, this workbook that I have here, I offer to my Patreon members. Uh, so every time I, I post a stock analysis video, I also post this workbook. Uh, that goes over you know, my valuation. I actually have four other valuations that I show my Patreon members as well, too. If you're interested, uh, it has a, you know, a bunch of historical data here on, on graphs and all the uh, 10 years of financials for balance sheet, cash flow, uh, different valuation metrics uh, that you can check out, ratios. Also goes through growth, uh, growth estimates for analysts as well over the you know next several years. So you can kind of see what they think they're going to do, different street targets and all that good stuff. So if you're interested, I'll put a link down description for my Patreon. You also get access to my Discord channel as well. So thank you so much for watching. If there's a video or a stock that you want me to do analysis on, drop that down in the comment section. If you haven't already, please like the video on the way out. Think about subscribing to my channel too if you like this kind of content. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you on the other side. Take care. God bless.